What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash, and today is November 4th of 2017. Well folks, as you all keep up with the channel, you know that we talk extensively about how cryptocurrencies are reshaping the way we think about money, finance, technology, and a variety of global industries. However, a lot of the times we forget to talk about at its core the technology that fuels cryptocurrency, blockchain. Blockchain itself is the most revolutionary piece of technology, at least in my opinion, since the internet. And a lot of people would agree with that exact statement because it is reshaping a multitude of different industries. So today I want to spend some time to kind of get out of the crazy hype of, you know, cryptocurrencies as a whole and talking about the hottest ICO and rather focusing on industries that blockchain could succeed in. And along with this, this is going to be a segue into covering a variety of different industries later on and looking at potential portfolios in the crypto space that we could hold that could be tied to these different industries that we're focusing on, or at least that we see potential in, in the sense of blockchain technology. So that being said, let's go ahead and dive into it. And today I'm going to be showing you all the top five industries I see blockchain tapping into in the next decade. So first off, I want to talk about finance. Finance is going to see the biggest shakeup over the next five to 10 years, in my opinion, out of any industry in the case of blockchain. And we're already in the midst of it right now. Ever since Bitcoin's inception in 2009, there has been a shakeup in the way we think of digital currency. Whereas digital currency, if you were to think about it, really was how most of our money, you know, fiat currency, US dollars, the Chinese yuan, etc., are all on a digital network. About 98 to 99% of your money is digital nowadays. All of this was run by a central authority, a central bank, um, central exchanges for trading, and everything that you did was through centralized institutions. Well, with that centralized trust came lots of problems and lots of greed and self-interest. And the creation of Bitcoin, building decentralization into the world of finance, of currency, of you know transactions between peer-to-peer -peer networks, it changed the way we think about money. And because of that, we have a wide variety of different industries inside finance that are being reshaped by the world of blockchain. So what are those? Well, at the core, as we've been saying, currency. Currency is at its core going to be the biggest thing that reshapes finance. At the end of the day, we are talking about cryptocurrency after all. And even though not all cryptocurrencies are legitimate currencies, or in the case of Bitcoin, it's a currency, but it's very hard to scale in the sense of you know making daily transactions or micro transactions, we are reshaping the way currencies work. We're having these cryptocurrencies that have set rules that they follow in the case of Bitcoin, having a limited supply at 21 million and things like that that cannot be manipulated by a centralized institution. We all agree to these rule sets. And as a community, we have to work together to make these cryptocurrencies work in the long term. For example, in the case of you know Bitcoin working with scaling. And there's a multitude of other cryptocurrencies that are trying to fight for that seat to be the world currency that people can use. Or, and I think, honestly, at the end of the day, we're going to have a ton of different currencies. But again, that's probably the biggest aspect of the finance sector. However, there's a lot of other focus points. A big one I believe in, and I still have really yet to see come into fruition, but it's something I believe is going to actually you know, kind of derail the banks is lending and funding through peer-to-peer -peer networks. Peer-to-peer -peer lending, you've probably heard of. There's a lot of companies in the space that are trying to do this, such as Lending Club. Um, and it's something that has always interested me because I believe that in the world of lending, in the world of you know, being able to fund different projects, we see things like Kickstarter, for example, where people are coming together and they're supporting projects in a very early stage. And sometimes things can become very successful. And thanks to that funding, ideas which originally couldn't come into fruition are now coming into fruition and they're becoming reality. So I think lending and funding is going to be a huge thing. Um, and I think that it's going to scale from the smallest of operations to the largest. You know, so making home loans, you know, all kinds of things that banks traditionally did. And it's not going to be a collusive system. It's not going to be this centralized authority and the failed monetary system that we have right now. So it's going to be much cleaner, much brighter, and it's going to bring the benefit of lending to the people of the world rather than a very centralized institution that has been able to, well, I could rail on banks for hours. I won't go on that tangent. But again, I think that that is something that is being completely undervalued in the sense of finance. So hopefully we'll see more of this inside the cryptoverse. Along with this, investing as well, uh, decentralized investing, as we've been covering projects like LaToken and a lot of other that are trying to tokenize digital or either physical or digital assets or commodities and different types of things that we can trade. 
I think that investing on the blockchain is going to become a very big thing because so long as you have smart contracts, you can build these free markets where people can actually make exchanges with, exchanges with one another that are more secure, that are under certain rules and boundaries that we set and allows at the same time for more freedom. So I really do think the idea of investing on the blockchain is going to be a big thing as well. But we'll have to see more with uh, the amount of legal regulation there is as to whether or not it really can become a reality because that is something that's as a barrier to entry right now for investing taking off on the blockchain along with that money transferring uh, and this also goes hand in hand with the next one international remittance uh, money transferring on the blockchain is amazing uh, as you all probably know i can make a transaction with someone over uh, in the sense of bitcoin which is one of the more outdated pieces of technology in the crypto space I can make a Bitcoin transaction from here and you know Palo Alto all the way out to someone in Shanghai or someone over in you know some country in Europe, and I can make it within a matter of ten minutes. That's amazing um, to, to think that I can make a transaction like that, and it can be in someone else's wallet like that in ten minutes. And that's Bitcoin. If you consider things like Ripple, if you consider technologies like Stellar Lumens, where transactions can be made within seconds, that is a game changer. It used to take weeks to process this because banks are extremely inefficient and they're doing it through a centralized ledger where they're trying to process transactions and it doesn't work. It's not powerful enough. Blockchain is making that possible. And in the case of international remittance, which if you don't know what that means, it's usually when you take money back home to your families after you've immigrated to another country uh, where you're, you're earning a sell, sell, um, stellar salary and then you want to bring it back home. Or if you just want to funnel money back home, usually to countries that are less well off or less fortunate. You can do that through blockchain. It makes it simple. And again, that goes back to money transferring. It used to not be practical. It was very difficult. And you lost a lot of the funds that you worked for. Now with international remittance, you can do that with cryptocurrencies and pay little to no fees and get it there much quicker in the case of emergency situations as well. So that's good. Along with that, as we were talking about uh, kind of investing on the blockchain, there is going to be tradable markets for insurance and healthcare. Your insurance and healthcare policies uh, follow under an assessment of risk. And because of that, on the blockchain where there can be both information stored and you can have different markets as well competing in these different industries, insurance and healthcare do have a future on the, uh, the blockchain in the sense of finance. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see these types of markets come into fruition and start competing not only for your business, but also being able to, you know, garner information and risk assessment on the blockchain because it's just, to me, I, I think it's something that, you know, insurance and healthcare has been lacking is a, a, a solid platform, not only to market it and make it competitive, but along with this, have the information and data available. So again, this could tap into a wide variety of different kind of liability policies, but I think insurance and healthcare is going to be huge. Um, and we'll, we'll learn more about that as we, we go through uh, and covering the finance video that I do um, for the financial portfolio of cryptocurrency. So we'll talk a lot about all these different focus points uh, once we do the individual video. And remember, I'm going to do an individual video for finance and all of the other sectors we cover in, this, cover in this video. So this is just kind of a segue into those different videos. Next up is supply chain management slash Internet of Things. This is something that I still think is not being put in the spotlight because it's not a very, um, I would say is where there's a lot of flashy ICOs about branding and marketing and more things that are more user interactive. This is something that's going to be adopted on the enterprise side. And it's something that people aren't going to see on a day-to-day -day basis unless they work on supply chain management or you know, manage, you know, management of projects and global networks. This is where blockchain has potential, serious potential. Um, and we've seen this through a lot of players, as I'll talk about in the video specialized for this, but there's a few different focus points inside this type of market. Uh, it's a really relatively broad one, but the Internet of Things, generally speaking, if you don't know what the terminology means, it means the tracking of information on goods and services as they go around the world or tracking different types of statistics, such as weather, um, the quality assurance of a product, as we have down there as well, quality assurance and tracking. It's all kinds of different information, weather, um, you know, global networks in the sense of transport, uh, all kinds of really interesting things and being able to use the blockchain to store that information and keep track of it consistently. So consistently updating information, keeping on top of where things are, what, you know, information is currently providing us right now in the sense of our tracking technologies. Um, and that's really what the Internet of Things is all about. It can also be used for health and data, uh, sorry, data health and stuff like that in the sense of tracking your health information. Um, 
And it is really interesting. I think the Internet of Things has uh, kind of been a bold concept that wasn't practical a few years ago. But with things like blockchain, it's becoming not only practical, it's becoming efficient and reasonable. So I think that's going to be quite interesting. We'll be covering a lot of uh, technologies in relation to that, as well as what's under it, global shipping. Uh, shipping. I love more than anything, uh, you know, envisioning global networks of shipping and, you know, shipping things across the world, the shipping yards with huge crates and everything, kind of like we have in the picture here. But it is amazing to think of the global networks that we have built as humans to ship goods and services. However, there are a lot of inefficiencies and blockchain is coming in to resolve that and keep track of it even faster and cheaper. So again, whereas blockchain can save us on the sense of transactions and the sense of lower fees and faster transaction times, Blockchain can do that as well in industries like global shipping. So, and again, as we, we already kind of talked about with the Internet of Things, it's kind of a, uh, you know, they're, they're definitely a similar kind of labels in the sense of Internet of Things and product quality assurance. But generally speaking, if you're wondering what I mean by product quality assurance, it could be that making sure you know where you got your product from. For example, if you go to the grocery store, uh, there could be a little uh, RFID chip that you could scan or QR code that you could track on your mobile phone and you could see where something's been. You can tell what farm it came from, you could tell what factory it came from, uh, the certain ingredients that are inside there, the app could scan and see that something doesn't have you know, certain ingredients that you're looking to avoid or if it does, you know, things like that. And uh, again, just more information at our fingertips with this kind of stuff, so it's really interesting. Another thing that I recently figured out about was counterfeit prevention. Now, with product quality assurance, we can also guarantee where something comes from. So, in the sense of counterfeit prevention, using RFID technology, we are able to implement that information on the blockchain and know exactly where our products come from. So if something is coming through a black market in the sense of counterfeits and isn't coming from a true supplier, we can know that. We can know when something's been a counterfeit product. And this is, I think, an issue that people underestimate. It's a multi-billion dollar industry tens of billions of dollars in counterfeit. It's a huge issue over in China. And this is why uh, Walton Chan, if I remember correctly, is focusing on retail. Of course, that's one of the coins we will talk about. But Walton Chan was the big one that people always talked about in the sense of uh, this kind of supply chain management, Internet of Things. Um, and I think that uh, they're focusing on retail first and foremost, you know, clothing. And a lot of people will be like, why aren't you doing something more exciting or anything like that? Because it's a massive industry. And being able to spot counterfeit will be huge in China. And that will lead to mass scale adoption of this kind of supply chain management Internet of Things industry. Along with this, something that's a little bit, uh, might, might be a little bit shocking, you might be wondering why is this in this category, is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, now, I understand it's, it's very keen for people to want to throw buzzwords at blockchain because blockchain itself is a buzzword. So machine learning plus blockchain Oh my gosh, I've got a multi-billion dollar idea right here. No, just kidding. But I mean, there is a lot of potential for artificial intelligence and machine learning, especially machine learning, to be built on top of the blockchain and spot trends on how things go across certain networks to boost efficiency, to reduce costs, to find new potential markets. And I think that with different types of machine learning and building all these kinds of you know, things on top of blockchain, we can really start to make things more efficient. We can learn trends. And as someone who's a data nerd myself, I love stuff like this. So I think that, again, it's going to not only improve the efficiency of this in these industries, but really truly reshape how we approach our business on these industries rather than just you know cutting down transaction costs and times as well. Next up is enterprise solutions. Now, this is a very, very large one, and I, I, I know it doesn't seem like it because I only have four bullet points here, but enterprise solutions is going to be one of the larger ones, and there's a reason for this. And to prove it to you, if you look at, for example, the cryptocurrencies that are trending, you know, for example, Ethereum, NEO, Quantum, um, ARC, uh, ICON, you know, all of these large ones, either big ICOs or cryptocurrencies that are in the lead, are enterprise solutions. They all share that same feature. And basically what it means to be an enterprise solution, um, cryptocurrency or being built on the blockchain and using blockchain for enterprise solutions, is to build enterprise applications. Okay, so for example, on Ethereum, people can build decentralized applications, um, you know, programming in different varieties of languages, and being able to build that and build decentralized networks on the blockchain. So 
again, it's a very revolutionary topic. And the reason why I had to keep it as short as enterprise applications is because there is an infinite amount of possibilities with this. Um, it's as simple as what you can do with blockchain. What are the limits of blockchain? And then what, what, you know, what markets out there need this? And again, enterprise applications could generically be a term to describe a lot of what we're talking about. But at the same time, this is going to be more corporate enterprise adopting, adopting blockchain to build different types of applications for its company. Um, so again, infinite possibilities with this. The second up is almost something that I think people would argue could be its own as well, which is cloud storage. But I think of this more as an enterprise solution because right now there is a big effort, um, again, another kind of buzz trend, is everything's going to the cloud, okay? So because of this, uh, whereas cloud storage has become very centralized under around two to three companies, you have both Amazon, you have Google, and a few other players in the space that have absolutely dominated this industry, you have blockchain coming into the picture. Really surprisingly to many people, they don't realize that at the end of the day, our computers have everything we need to store information. I mean, we do it ourselves and we can streamline and store information for other individuals. And what happens is on these decentralized networks on the blockchain, we can not only encrypt, but break up those files and put them on a variety of different computers around the world, personal computers. So I, as an individual, if I had your, some of your information on my computer, I couldn't you know, extract it or read it or anything. It's so highly encrypted and so broken up, but I can get paid in whatever cryptocurrency or you know through the blockchain technology, I can benefit from helping you store your information. And it doesn't have to be in the hands of Amazon. It doesn't have to be in the hands of one central authority that if you know something were to break into that system, we would be absolutely screwed if they were able to do any kind of damage. Um, again, even though the services are very reliable, at the end of the day, cloud storage is becoming quite competitive on the blockchain. As we talked, efficiency is key and efficiency leads to lower costs. Blockchain is proving that there are multiple cloud storage applications that are reducing cost, reducing time, and they're making it much more practical and comparative to things like Amazon. So again, I, I think we're very early on in the space, but if we see it in the next five to 10 years as cloud storage continues to grow and if the innovation can continue in blockchain, I think it's got a future. Next up is governance systems. So we've seen uh, a lot of players come to the space, you know, with the, the topic of blockchain. Uh, it's seen as something that's ungoverned, you know, it's something that's decentralized. However, there are applications that are being built on top of the blockchain to make blockchain and its efficiencies more applicable for the centralized world where there's companies, organizations, governance bodies that are able to use the blockchain to implement certain rules, grouping, etc. Aragon um, is probably the biggest uh, that, that's really tried to attempt this. Um, but there are a lot of other players that are going to be coming into the in this kind of market that are you know setting governance systems, rule systems on the blockchain. Um, and again, I think it's it's something that does have some room to grow, especially with all these other industries that are going to need systems of structure. So it's interesting to see how you, you'll see with um, different projects like District OX uses Aragon's technology on top of its blockchains. I mean, there's multi layer. It's blockchains on blockchains, guys. We're we're going through blockception, <laughs> but Anyways, on the last part of enterprise solutions, contract and agreement systems. This solely has to do with, in the sense of what I'm describing here with smart contracts. Um, so smart contracts, again, another buzzword in the crypto space, but smart contracts are ways of digital contracts between individuals that run off specific code that say, if this, then this, and if both parties agree, we get to execute on something. This can be a wide variety of things. People are making custom smart contracts uh, on the Ethereum network and a variety of other networks. So smart contracts do have a position in the future and this whole kind of digital contract agreement system between two peer-to-peer -peer, uh, you know, parties and stuff, contacting one another, coming to agreements and you know trying to resolve in certain issues and solutions. I think it's got a huge space and I think smart contracts, again, are another thing inside blockchain that are completely underrated. So. Next up, but this is a very big topic, something that I'm very passionate about as well, Web 3.0. Now, in my, uh, my last portfolio video I did a while back, I think it was all the way back in August, um, a lot of people uh, you saw that I used Web 2.0. And technically, I guess that was a little bit of a misusing because we are technically in Web 2.0 right now. So I decided I was gonna call this Web 3.0 because Web 3.0 is really the next shift in changing the way we think of the internet, of, uh, you know, 
that we use at a daily basis, whether it be through our smartphones, uh, our, our computers, our tablets, whatever it may be, and also just generally how the internet as a whole operates. And there is a lot of change coming with blockchain being brought to the internet. So what are some of those things? Well, the first one is something I'm very passionate about. And I think, you know, if you see the first term here, you probably know with how much I talk about it, what cryptocurrency I'm talking about tied to it. But, you know, for, the, for this case, uh, I'll keep my mouth shut and we'll talk about this in the uh, Web 3.0 video. But the decentralized web. Now, what is a decentralized web? Well, the decentralized web, uh, there's a few different renditions of how we were going to approach the decentralized web. It would be basically taking it out of very central authorities that web hosts. So, for example, again, going back to the big players, Amazon. You know, Amazon is a huge web hoster as well as other players in the space, such as GoDaddy, Bluehost, etc., that host the websites that we go on on a daily basis. However, in those centralized authorities, they get to run the game. They get to run the pricing. They get to run how things, how efficient things run. Because of that, because of those systems, we are left in the cracks of censorship, of worrying about whether or not the internet is going to be reliable tomorrow. Can I go on the websites that I used to go on? You know, the biggest thing is really censorship at the end of the day. And that's why I think there's a big push with cryptocurrency and blockchain to dismantle the censorship that we have in the world, as well as the embreaching on privacy, which is so important. Um, and because of blockchain and this decentralization and the decentralized web, we will be able to counter the symptoms of the modern day internet, which is, whereas many think it's decentralized, it's very centralized. There's a few select companies that really own and run the majority of the internet that we use. So very big, very big market opportunity in my mind. So we'll have to see how that can develop and come into fruition. But along with this, talking about privacy, privacy and encryption. Uh, and really generally just, you know, security of information is going to be huge. Uh, privacy crypto, uh, cryptocurrencies have been something that's taken the headlines recently. And whereas originally was one of the big reasons for Bitcoin uh, has now come back into the spotlight because Bitcoin itself really isn't that private at the end of the day. And there's lots of, of ways that they're enforcing not only security in the sense of encryption, but also private transactions. So there's things like Monero, Verge, uh, Pivx, um, Dash. I mean, you can look and there's a variety of cryptocurrencies that have come up out of nowhere because they offer different versions of, you know, securely making transactions between two parties without anyone knowing or knowing who you are. It might be on a public ledger, but we won't know who those two individuals are. And I think that's important. Along with that, having private messaging and sharing services. What I do like out nowadays, something that a lot of people don't know, is things like you know WhatsApp, um, I'm trying to think of other ones as well, Telegram, which you use and stuff, you can have encrypted chats and they're practically unbreakable. But I think as we move towards the blockchain as well, there is room for that to expand. Um, and not only that, build applications on top of that where it's more than just simply messaging and sharing. There might be more things we can build on top. So I, I wanna see if there's more we can build in that space of you know kind of bringing decentralization and messaging and sharing and continuing to encrypt it and break it up even more for more security reasons. Along with that, social media and web communications. This is something that a lot of people have been seeing with Steemit, for example. Again, don't want to list too many cryptocurrencies and stuff, but uh, Steemit is a, an obvious clear example of that. Uh, being able to instantly go on a website like Steemit and I can go on the web and know that you know I'm, I'm using a platform, but at the same time not even know that I'm using blockchain. This is going to be huge. And along with that, there's web communities, as we mentioned earlier, like District OX, that are doing these kinds of things, that are building online web communities built on the blockchain that aren't run by some central authority, that can't just be shut down. And that's very powerful. And it lets the community self-govern and you know get interested in what they really are interested in. You know, upvote certain content that whether or not it's controversial or not, you know, again, bring it back to the people. Uh, very, very important on a moral sense as well. Peer-to-peer -peer services. Uh, this is something that we're going to talk about more in the uh, one of the later phases that we're going to cover later on. However, peer-to-peer -peer services on the web. I think this is uh, definitely a big industry. Now, what do I mean by peer-to-peer -peer services? Uh, this could be things like freelance work. Now you don't have a middleman cutting you out of your, your business. You can simply just be, be a freelance, produce content for people, you know, do all kinds of services on the web without someone taking a cut out of it. Um, and we've seen this as well, um, you know, this again, overlapping industries with things like, uh, I think the kick ICO um, that came out um, and uh, was trying to decentralize things like Kickstarter, for example, that take cuts out of what you, uh, what you get from crowdfunding. And 
to be honest, even though I don't know if I'd, I'd be completely supportive of the project that I, you know, I mentioned for the Kick ICL, it is cool to see that there is potential in the sense of taking these industries where there are middlemen that get in the way of you and a party just making a simple peer-to-peer -peer transaction of you know service for currency. I think that there are spaces for this in blockchain. And I think that blockchain is making it so we can communicate without that middleman. Along with that, we have content streaming. There's been a variety of different projects that are trying to do this, but if you really want a general picture of what I mean by it in the sense of content streaming on the blockchain, streaming information, such as, you know, for example, how we use Netflix to watch TV shows, movies, um, all kinds of different web-based services where we can stream content uh, and there's no middleman in the way. It's just a simple platform that people can upload information on, we can extract it, sometimes they can charge for it, whatever it may be. Again, very, very powerful opportunity for blockchain. Seeing as there no, is no centralized authority and really no way to shut it down, it provides a very big, uh, I would almost say Pandora's box in a sense. It won't be perfect, but at the same time, it is, it's there and it's going to give us a ton of freedom in the sense of information um, and you know, learning, you know, education and stuff like that, which I'm really optimistic about as well. Web browsing. Uh, this is something that uh, was generally, um, I guess, uh, I think most of you know what BAT is, um, and I'll talk about that as we go through the Web 3.0 video. Uh, however, people are building uh, these new web browsers that use blockchain technology, uh, and then they also have different systems where they aren't like traditional web services um, like Chrome um, or uh, Firefox, you know, out, kind of outdated web browsers, Internet Explorer. And they have different systems that uh, can allow you to choose in much more ways of freedom whether or not you want to uh, have monitors on your browsing history, if you want advertisements, things like that. And you can get rewarded for, in the case, and I'm, I'm, I keep on trying to mention cryptocurrencies, but basic attention token is a huge example of this, uh, where we can actually go about being rewarded if we decide to give up our user information on the web. So it's, it's a choice. It's whether or not you want ads or not, um, or if you want to be rewarded for it if you allow advertising. So again, really interesting thing. And this is something that, again, I think a lot of people would build their own category for, but I don't see it as a massive market opportunity. Um, and this is a voting and crowd, um, crowd um, um, polling. Uh, the reason why I think this is big is because there's a lot of issues with trust in the sense of polling of information. There's a lot of ma manipulation. Uh, there's a lot of systems where there's voter fraud in elections. Uh, on a global network, there is huge voter fraud issues across the world. And because of this, Voting and crowd polling is something that could be uh, very well implemented on the blockchain and it's already being implemented. The reason why this is so good and why it's meant for blockchain is because blockchain has a public, in most cases, has a public distributed ledger. So we all have a copy of the records. We can see them there and print and as they update, as the network updates, we get those up to date, you know, votes and stuff. So we all have a record. No one can just you know, fish in new votes and say, oh, we have 10,000 votes for XYZ candidate or for this, you know, new, you know, um, new innovation for our company, you know, things like that. There can be no manipulation. Um, again, we haven't seen any massive adoption of this, but I think in the long term, it will be very, very fitting to fix this larger issue at hand. And last but not least, decentralized markets. Now, you might only see, as much as this is a huge one, uh, I only have two bullet points because it's pretty self-explanatory. Decentralized markets are going to be a mix of e-commerce and peer-to-peer -peer services. In the case of e-commerce, e as you all know, this is a huge industry. Um, commerce itself, brick-and-mortar stores, the you know physical retail that you go into every day, it's dying. You know, it, it's still there and it will be there for, I think, personally, I'm, I'm honestly one of the more optimistic people. Some people think it's going to die off in you know, the next five years. I think brick and mortar still has a position in the world. People still like to go to restaurants. People like to, you know, sometimes go into a th place like Walmart and stuff and actually go, you know, see physical items, feel them before they buy them, um, oh, et cetera. But however, at the end of the day, the trends are clear. E-commerce is here to stay and it's becoming more and more of a way of life having things shipped to your home, etc. And I think we all know the big names, Amazon, more than anything. Um, however, at the end of the day, uh, e-commerce is becoming a multi-trillion dollar industry, but it is not regulated to simply being run by centralized institutions. We are seeing things, for example, like eBay, which is more kind of a peer-to-peer -peer thing rather than uh, you know, a centralized company like Amazon distributing it. And with things like eBay, 
become decentralized applications. And that's the case of things, uh, of course, I, I don't want to mention any names, but there are be, uh, now decentralized uh, ways of applying blockchain to building these decentralized e-commerce markets where people can sell goods and services, small businesses, individuals, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, and we can have also large corporations selling things. Not to mention, as we were talking about privacy earlier, we have that sense of privacy with e-commerce. Um, again, we'll talk about this more and how there's been a lot of competitors in this market. However, there hasn't really been any yet that have taken off. That's the real question here is if you can get something that can beat uh, the, the services of Amazon. That's the real problem with this is, is whether or not it can really compete with Amazon in the sense of reducing costs, reducing, you know, uh, transaction times, things like that, and also guaranteeing that customers can have a good experience on it and uh, setting systems of smart contracts to make things more flexible and free. Again, very big industry, I think, personally, um, and especially in the sense of privacy. Second up, now we already talked about peer-to-peer -peer services, but this is going to be something a little more broad. Um, now, what I mean by peer-to-peer -peer services here is whereas I was talking about stuff like freelancing, more web-based, um, everything you know on the web nowadays, uh, all the services we use a lot of the times are built off the web, and they're built off these new markets that are slowly but surely kind of decentralizing or changing the way we originally thought about how they were run. For example, biggest shakeup I think we've seen in the past few years is in the tax industry and transport with Uber. Uh, Uber has brought almost, not a decentralized, it's still under Uber, a centralized company, but a much more decentralized approach where you don't need to be under the taxi lobby. You can be under the company Uber and you can be an Uber driver whenever you want. There's no standard quotas of hours, things like that. It's completely up to you and a peer uh, that needs a ride and they come to an agreement. Well, we can do this on decentralized networks. We can get rid of the middleman Uber and all the fees that it charges. And we can make it as simple as I'm walking out on the street, I have my mobile phone, I need a ride, and some guy on the network can see that through the blockchain that I need a ride. He can see my certain standards, how much I'm willing to pay, where I need to go, and simply, he can agree to do it, and he can tell me a bunch of information about what he does, you know, what his ride experience is like, and we can come to an agreement, and we can, you know, implement a smart contract, and we can go about exchanging, or just simply making transactions for those certain services. So. Again, there is a lot of applications in the peer-to-peer -peer service market, and decentralized markets are going to make that a reality, to make those services not just transportation, but everything. Um, again, there is so many ways that we, if we, once we decentralize these industries, uh, multi-trillion dollar industries are going to become you know, pulled out on the network. And they're going to become something that's much more competitive in the sense of price and much more efficient being on the blockchain. But again, we'll have to see what industries do that. And we will do a video much like all the other topics on decentralized markets and what's been developing in the space because there is a lot of exciting things going on. Well, everyone, that's it for the video. I know I rambled on a lot, but I love talking about blockchain. It's something that I don't talk about enough, the innovation, the potential behind blockchain. So I want to know right off the bat what industry excites you the most. I want to get a discussion going. As you all know, we're really passionate about the community we've built here, Datadash, and I'd love to hear with you all down in the comments down below. And I'll try to engage with you all and share any information I know. Um, but along with that, I do want to be clear with you all. As much as I'm optimistic on blockchain, we see a lot of fancy ICOs coming into the space. And we see a lot of, you know, next big things coming in and saying, oh, this is something on the blockchain or, you know, you know, you know, the same old story. It's the same old thing that's been happening for the past year. However, I will say that we have to be critical. Uh, as much as I can be optimistic on the blockchain, not everything can be brought on the blockchain. It's the reason why I believe 90 to 95 percent of ICOs are going to fail. However, on a more positive note, that 5 to 10% with how much innovation is going on in the space, that 5 to 10% is quite large, and that innovation is going to reshape how we think of the world. Again, think of the mobile apps that have come in and changed the world over the past few years, how we've reinvented entire industries and started to slowly bring that freedom back to individuals. Blockchain is going to be that next step, in my opinion, and I can't wait to see the innovations that come in the space. But what is going to change? Well, we'll have to give it due time and we'll have to see how much blockchain can change the world. Anyways, everyone, that's it for the video. Thank you all so much for watching. If you all have anything you want me to cover on this channel, leave it down in the comments down below. But until then, everyone, I will see you all in the next video. Stay tuned.